focusing for this presentation a bit on some of the partnerships that we recently have created to engage and to push the needle a bit within healthcare. Uh, one of which would be a Kaiser Permanente relationship that just evolved from one angle, especially also from Parkinson's net, with uh, friends from uh, Bas Bloom and uh, Marta Munnike exporting the model into Kaiser Permanente Southern California. And there will be a lot more involvement uh, 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 on that as well. Uh, a few months ago, we were able, together with Cambridge University, to act as the only two university medical centers to engage with Apple in Apple's health kit. And I'll talk about that briefly later on as well. And only recently, we've joined a, a partnership together with Salesforce and Philips, in which we create this new model of clinical modules to bring data from patients back into the clinical setting and try to engage on that. For those who do not know who we are at Radboud University Medical Center, we're about 11,000 colleagues. Uh, uh, all but three are working at present. Han van Krieke and uh, Jessica is, uh, is present as well uh, for, for now. They're, they're kind of looking whether or not I'm start bragging about stuff like uh, the things that we're doing. Uh, we've got 3,000 uh, students, uh, medical students, dentists, uh, and biomedical students as well. And maybe the second two bullets will be the most important ones because at present we have about 1,000 beds and we're up to, in our ambition, to close down about 500 of them. That's not an economic measurement, and we won't close them down, actually. That's the good news. But if in 10 years from now, we would still treat those same patients in those 500 beds as we do today, we have done something terribly wrong, looking into all the kinds of technologies that are hitting healthcare. So my talk will be about the most important innovation ever, which we've got a great technology name for it. Let's call them patients. Because that's the one thing that we see over and over again, that we as healthcare professionals over the course of the last decades try to innovate for patients. We tend to know what patients need it. We tend to know what patients think. We tend to know what they want. And actually, we haven't had the clue on that. We had the clues from a medical perspective, maybe even a bit from a nursing perspective, maybe from the technological perspective. But there was no way and time, actually, to really discuss with them. There's some great research being done, for instance, from Mayo's, that shows and proves that the average doctor, so those would not be the ones in this audience today, interrupts their patients within 12 seconds after starting the discussion in the consultation room. 12 seconds. And then we think to know that we know what they're up to. So from the innovation perspective, we kind of started from innovating for patients to innovate with patients. And that's great. We've, uh, about five years ago, we've appointed our first CLO. Does everybody, do you got your own CFO in your own company? Or the CEO? So we had the very first CLO, Chief Listening Officer. And the thing she did is listening in the central hall in outpatient clinics and in, at patients at their own kitchen table, how in the world could we really help you? And that, doing the talk about like two or three hours maybe, prior to diving into all kinds of changing processes and process improvement. And now we're up to change in and take the next leap. So now we are going to facilitate our patients to innovate themselves, creating building blocks from which they can do the things that they think that's needed for us. And we'll step a bit at the side of that. We think that's great. So looking from those kind of perspectives, we really think if you have an innovation set up, which didn't incorporate the patients right from the very first start. So this is, this is not about an app that is going to be in launch and then asking your patients whether or not that they can read it or it's the right color. No, it's really engaging them from the very first step on. You really should trash it because that's the reason why 90% of all e-health applications fail. Because somebody thought that it was a good idea and just forgot to ask the people who are at stake for that. So that's one. The secondly, second one that is always missing in these kind of discussions are nurses. Everybody talks with professors, with doctors, with administrators, IT people. Who is talking to the nurses? That's the reason why we've created this little small batch to really think and every day again think about let's include the nurses as well. Because after you guys as physicians have left the patient room, Going over to the next ones, they're the ones who have to pick up the trash and to really engage with patients into it. So that should be one of the things that we really should take into an account. Clayton Christensen, a famous Harvard professor, has done a fair amount of work in terms of what is changing 
a branch and how innovations really change those kind of steps. And the thing that he says is that everyone tries to innovate on a very high quality and very high value. So we almost tend to think to know what the next step will bring. And over the course of the weekend, for instance, somebody in Silicon Valley just posts a new application for it, and all of a sudden your world has changed. And the interesting thing that Clayton says is that in this market from today's, newcomers in that market almost always win. And that's very interesting to see, and especially looking into healthcare. And I kind of describe this as the, what I call the pre-gap. Just let's take an example for it. This is the Alive Core um, EKG module that was at first in a sleeve, a little gadget that I could put up at the back end of my cell phone and create a 1K EKG. So at first, all the cardiologists kind of snapped, like, doesn't work, won't be reimbursed, is not FDA approved. You can imagine all those kind of things. It took the guy, uh, by the way, 86 um, 86 year old cardiologist from uh, uh, I think it was Cleveland to within nine months to get the a FDA approvement to get the reimbursement system up and running and now a few weeks ago he had this one millionth AKG sent into a system and you can buy these kind of devices for 200 bucks in a web shop having it sent to your own home and for 10 bucks a month you take it a subscription to three cardiologists that kind of divided the world in three time zones, and you can imagine 24-7, keep an eye on you and say, you should go to this ER department, and really fast as well. And then all of a sudden, all kind of cardiology clinics started to engage on this. And that's the interesting one. That's the moment in time that you will realize that you're too late. And that's a bit of the common denominator of the things that are happening. We've kind of seen already, let's say, five democratizations, for instance, by the role of the internet. We all know what happened to travel. We all know travel, you know, travel bureaus, the things that in the old days you go and fetch the brochures and then nowadays you book online and that's the stuff that's, the, that's work. Retail, banking as well, and I think we're at this intersection where patients at one end and technologies at the other one are kind of creating a new consumerization of healthcare. And that is also done by, kind, by new players. And I recently called that the Uberization of healthcare. I, I got here from The Hague with a cap. I just called in an Uber, you know, push one button and expecting, by the way, that it took them like 30, 45 minutes to get there. Within seven minutes, brum, brum, he, kind of, he perfectly drove me over here. And this is the Uber of healthcare. I can. This, is Terran, uh, this is Elizabeth Holmes, who has created this company, which is called Terranos. She's a Next week, she turned 30 years old, uh, uh, did four years medical school, and dropped out. She had this, what they call epiphany, during one of the colleges. And she created this company that creates from two drops of blood in a nanotainer of blood at Walgreens. Again, Walgreens. For $5.99, she runs 200 of the most common blood tests that will be in your email inbox within two hours after you've just given your blood. Already in 90 locations in Southern California, she's running this place. And within nine months from the real launch, she is already in the top 10 of the Forbes top 10 of the billionaires of the world. That's the new world that we live in. That's not somebody from, from within healthcare, for instance. And that's one of the things that now all the laboratories in, in the United States kind of start boggling about. We should run the same stuff for it. But that's a game that's already lost. And we will see a lot of those games in the very near future because there is a great technology coming up and you might argue whether or not that this will be the new hospital room of the future. And I, by the way, don't think that's true because I really think that this will be the new hospital room of the future. And we kind of see that the location of delivering healthcare is going to shift, not only from hospitals to clinics in the neighborhood, but also to points of care, just like, for instance, these supermarkets would do. And I've taken with me, kind of geluid krijgen. Well, I could run it without sun, but it's more fun with. 
I've taken with me a, a little small video that is created um, uh, at Singularity University by IDEO, one of the huge design uh, firms. And in this video, we'll show all kinds of technology that's available today. But to be honest, we've kind of hidden 2% stuff that's not able to really run today. So I would like to dare you whether or not you could share with me what's, uh, what is kind of uh, not true yet. No sound? No, okay, well, just leave it for now. Um, what you'll see in this little video is that at point of care at the homes of the, the, these people that are trying to engage with their little youngster, uh, they're able to, together with their smartphone, take some pictures of a rash at the body of their kid. And from that, sending that out to a knowledge system, which you could easily imagine that this would be Dr. Watson, so Watson's IBM's supercomputer. And they get the advice to just stay at home, to not run into whatever clinic. Or sitting at your couch, you all of a sudden get this alert that there's whooping cough in your neighborhood. And it also checks whether or not you got your booster up and running or not. And maybe right uh, spot on, create this appointment for you the next day. Or for instance, your little kid that is in bed creates this giant uh, kind of high fever. And you do not know whether or not that really is a problem. And not only with the measurements and the symptoms being added to it, also combined with the urine analysis, being able to really identify that this is indeed an infection that you should rush into the acute healthcare department. And that's also one of the things that we see right now. We, we will be checking our bodies as much as we check our email system. And that is the new world that we live in, I think. So has anybody any clue on what's not that possible today? To work with parents at home at the same time. <laughs> 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 oh. Well, that, that's a new one for me. Thank you for that. <laughs> that's good. Anybody else? Some people talk about this little Band-Aid just behind the ear. Well, it's available for 20 bucks. You can take your temperature from 15 meters away without even having to wake up your patient at 5 a.m. in the morning. Anymore. So that's no problem. Also, this rash system already discriminates about 90% of the 200 most common uh, uh, rashes that people can run into. That's also possible. And by the way, the little gadgets that were used will be shipped somewhere between January and February, which is the Scanadu Scout, a little device that you put up to your temple. And for 199 bucks, being able to run nine vital signs from this little device. Within five years from now, that will be this little thermometer that you got in your cupboard in your own bathroom, for instance. And the interesting thing is that you will see more and more of these new players stepping into healthcare. And I really think that maybe not in 2020 or 2019, but these will be the companies that will democratize healthcare from outside in, just like it, they did with uh, travel, with music industry. Let's face it, Apple sold tons of iPads, they're already flooded the market. So they're looking to a new market and there's one market that everybody will run into in the end of the day and that will be health and healthcare. So that's the start for them, not only for Apple, Google, Samsung will be heavily engaging in 2015 on that and also Philips. I'm a bit biased, I'll have to admit that and I'll show a bit more on that later on, but Philips is also a company that is in your home already and is now starting to combine healthcare IT on that intersection and that will be huge. And maybe you've seen the news that three weeks ago, Walmart announced that within five years from now, they want to be the number one healthcare provider in the US. And they're pretty destined on that. So that will be something that we as healthcare will run into and also we'll be urged and forced to look more on a global scale to what we're doing. So great to look at na national Dutch scale for instance, but I really do think that that's something that we should look into. And looking from a healthcare IT perspective, this is what we've, over the course of the last 13 years, trying to create a nationwide uh, a clinical record. This is what we've came up to. Everybody engages with everybody, but somebody is left out of the equation, and that's the patient themselves. <laughs> sure, great, two years, in 2012, as Radbot, we've opened a ball, our electronic medical records, which great. But still, it's only a peek at the data that's from me. And we, as Radboud, only have 2% of this huge amount of data from every patient. 
So who are we to say that we own the medical records? There's only one constant in this equation over and over again, and that's the patient themselves. So why not flip the chart? And that's exactly what we've been doing. Flipping the chart in terms of trying to get from these ego systems, which all these electronic medical record systems and healthcare institutions all are looking inside out, uh, from outside in, in terms of creating this ecosystem. And trying to create from the things that we learned from our CLO, uh, also, by the way, with an, the first international listening conference on healthcare, which is great. The videos will be up and running within a few weeks, so you might stop at that website uh, from us uh, again to see how patients think about how better listening in healthcare can improve it on a very easy way. So what we've seen from those kind of discussions that patients want their own personal health record, and I think that André is gone, or I think that André Piso has talked about that as well. Okay. So he, he, if he would... He has addressed that uh, perfectly, I think. The next thing that people want is a community to talk about. Community as in your family at first. And community as in local together with your caretakers. And community in terms of, hey, there are, so, there are more people in the Netherlands suffering from the same disease. Or a community from professionals who want to engage with themselves together. Like Parkinson's Net from Bosbloom and Martin Munich, which I mentioned earlier. And the second thing that people want is to engage in terms of EL, from all kinds of devices, which will start flooding the market in 2015 and 2016. This is going to be one of the biggest problems for healthcare, and not only from an IT perspective. Because people will step up to their patient, to their physician, with the information already. Who of you has already iOS 8 on his uh, iPhone? So all of you have this little app, which is called Health or Gezondheid, just with one push button being able to not only count your steps and the number of flights of stairs on how much you have biked, either or not to go up to Mount Ventura or, or Alpe d'Huez, without any costs extra to it. So if all of a sudden your physician asks you to step up and come with your blood pressure or with your weight, for instance, you will say, hey, guy, listen, just take a subscription on my data, right? Because there's no, there's no reason anymore to, to come to your great clinic with lousy coffee and always flooded parking lots. That's one of the things that is going to happen. And so we've kind of looked into that and created this concept which is called here's my data, as in the patient giving the data to the physician say, hey, this is your data. So instead of putting the patient central, which this might look like, we start to engage with patients as partners. And we will submit a copy of all, all records to the patient, and with that, to the, for them to share that with another physician, or share it with their relatives, or, for instance, adding information to it from all kinds of devices. I'm wearing one of those devices, by the way, it says, so this is not a logo of my, 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 my collar shirt or whatever, but this is a little device that keeps me walking straight up, because I've aligned this, and if I bend over a little bit, it starts buzzing. You can't hear it, but I feel it very clearly. Interesting enough, for instance, for Parkinson's patients who do not know that they were bending over prior to falling down, they will be correct and say, hey, I got your, that shoulder's right. Connecting to these kind of things. They, th these kind of things will evolve like 80, 90 bucks. That will be something that people will buy themselves. So you need this platform for that to, to combine all that data, and I'll get back into that later on, to have these great discussions and then create this clo loop, closed loop because that's the thing that you're looking for. And this closed loop, and I, as I understand, there were some questions about the evidence for PHRs this morning, and there is very low evidence yet, which is completely logical because from one end, we're only just starting with it. There were numerous e uh, PHRs already, but still only did one portion of the equation. So it's completely understandable that this evidence is not as, uh, as powerful as that we would love to. And the other thing is that all of those uh, PHRs still are only looking from a data perspective. And only data is just completely useless if you don't get, get any context into that. So one of the things that is happening, and we would love to prevent that, is the thing that I've just put up in this slide, is that you see all kinds of new systems evolve, which, is, uh, which are running either on, on, on Android or on iOS or whatever. And in Nijmegen, we've got these two ERs, and we really would love to prevent that somebody will ask you just at your doorstep, do you got an iPhone or do you got an Android? And if it's an Android, you've got to go to the other ER, because we don't cherish those kind of data. 
That's the thing that is happening right now because all the systems that I've seen up until now are completely closed systems. You can put data in it, you won't be able to get the data out of that. And that's a real problem that we will run into in the course of the next two years massively, I think. And so you should create vendor agnostic platforms for that that are open and able to connect into it. So that's what we were trying to look for. And over the course of the last days, we've kind of put up a li this little quiz. So I would love you to ask you, who of you would trust their data to send over to Apple? Okay. <laughs> Very critical audience. Um, just keep it up. Who would trust Google? <laughs> yeah? I said, well, uh, Facebook. <laughs> Mind you, keep an eye on the news. Within 14 days from now, you will start to shiver on what Facebook is going to pull off in healthcare in 2015. Because they really, just like Google, there is a reason why Google, Apple, and Facebook steps into healthcare. That's obvious. So just look into that and see and find a way to, to address that. And that's one of the reasons why we, together with Philips, uh, created this new system. By the way, you can plan a lot of things in your life, but sometimes things happen completely serendipitously. And I gave a talk at BNR Eye Openers, and when I stepped down from the stage, Jeroen Tas, who is the CEO of Philips Healthcare Informatics, came up on, uh, on stage. And he told me, hey, we, gotta, we just have to grab a cup of coffee because you just told that you guys are doing at Rodbot that we want to do. It took us six weeks to get on one table with this uh, great cup of coffee. And within 15 minutes, we've seen that our vision's completely aligned. Within 24 hours, our CEO back then, Melvin Sampson, had a talk with Frans van Houten. And they've, they've put on every traffic light on the green aspect of it. And in seven weeks later, we've announced an application in... Um, in San Francisco at Dreamforce, which is also, Salesforce is also one of our partners. And I've seen a lot of conferences, but I never have been to a conference with 140,000 people addressing them on the stuff that we've created within seven weeks. So hopefully the audio is working in the meantime. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's your cue. <laughs> Otherwise, it makes no sense to, uh, to show this. Well, it's... Hey, lose me the microphone. Oh, yeah. That's good. Thank you, Paul. Mm, I don't know. So let's do it like this. Oh, all right. Hopefully, it's not this. Let's take a pragmatic approach. I think human life, regardless of where you live on this planet, is all about freedom. And mobility is freedom. Okay, so how do you achieve mobility? Well, one of the ways you do it is to find out what you can or you can't do. I see my doctor about twice a year. And when I go into the office, he has to page through a three-ring binder in order to find out how I've been. But this is only twice a year. I'd like to know what's going on the rest of the year. Well, Philips is uh, highly motivated to help people with chronic conditions, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, but, but also COPD. And we decided to focus on COPD first with our e-care platform which is really engaging the patients and then collaborate the care behind that patient. And that's what we're doing here at Rothbard Hospital. You know, we're great at delivering healthcare in our own hospital, but bringing it outside of it into the homes of people, that's a different topic. You know, I've had three open heart surgeries, two hip replacements, COPD, you name it. I would love to see how my heart and lungs are working on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, there's what I consider to be a fundamental mistake in how we manage information in healthcare. And we haven't had any choice in the past, really, because the technology hasn't been there to solve this problem. What we do is we discover a problem after it's become a problem. For chronic illnesses like COPD, every office visit or test is just a snapshot in time of the patient's condition. 
we use these snapshots to determine our best recommendation for treatment, but it's always an incomplete story. The eCare application, combined with our Here's My Data platform, will create an environment for patients to really be empowered. With new wearable technologies, we can use sensor to track the patient's health measurements. The data is captured and collected in a cloud-based application. Both the patient and the provider can see what's happening in real time. So providers can adjust treatments between visits and patients can monitor their own condition. You know, for generations, how we practice healthcare has not changed. And now, in this continuous and connected world, we're going to be able to change everything. Philips bringing the care coordinator, Radbow bringing this wearable technology and new ways of delivering care, and Salesforce enabling it through our cloud technology. For the first time ever, we really are creating an environment where patients can really act as partners within their own healthcare. And that's awesome. But to just consider, all right, just the ability to capture the information in real time. Information is value. It's who has more at stake in the accuracy, completeness, and availability of good quality information than the patient and family. We're at the beginning of a transformation in healthcare. In the next 50 years of healthcare will blow away everything that we've done in the past. Well, what you have seen is what we can do for COPD patients, how we can make their lives much better. And it's only the beginning. It's only the beginning of what we can do for patients with chronic conditions and what we can mean for healthcare. I gotta, I gotta switch mics for this. So what we've created, by the way, is you might have seen the news yesterday about the Motiva system in the study. So this is the succeeder of the Motiva system. And one of the things that we've done together with this little patch that I'm wearing at present, I'm able to now measure nine vital signs uh, right uh, from, from, uh, from this position, including one EKG, respiratory rate, skin temperature, uh, stress level as well, by the way. So. Uh, I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> um, so the interesting thing is that this technology will evolve very fast, but you have to give meaning to it. So for that, we've created this clinical module for COPD, where patients can see their own data in a live system. They also can see that data, send it in to, for instance, the, phys the, the physician, who, by the way, also is able to see it within one week from now in their own, in our case, EPIC system because that is the information that your physician wants to have on top. But that's not the, the, the only thing. Looking to this partnership, we're also in, uh, enclosing all kinds of these ego systems that are submerged uh, already. And with that creating what we like to hope, an ecosystem that we as healthcare providers can empower patients with. Looking to what is happening is that stuff is getting smaller and smaller. On the ICU, this is the system we use. Now on General Ward, we are testing a little system that's connected to your wrist, being able to monitor the patient on ward from the ICU, still on the regular ward. And the next phase will be that we'll send off patients a day or a day earlier, one, or a day, one and a half day earlier, back to their home, monitoring them from our own uh, hospital. And a few months ago, I had the, uh, the honor to, to help Gil Baylor, which is a famous Dutch radio presenter, who was running a world record uh, uh, attempt to run 200 hours of continuously radio. So I smashed this little patch on the guy. Uh, and, and from Nyming, we've kind of monitored him all those, I think it was five and a half days on a row, uh, perfectly just from our own hospital. And stuff gets smaller and smaller. Just like I said earlier, this was the sleeve that you can take this EKG. The next phase is these kind of um, uh, uh, patches that we're unrolling. But the next phase is already at, at, at our doorstep, which are and I, I'm wearing one of those little uh, skin tattoos that are doing exactly the same, measuring nine of my vital signs 24-7 for about a week. So that's also the speed that these kind of things are happening, because that's the thing. This were two measurements, heartbeat and EKG. This one already had nine vital signs, and this little guy has 14 different signs that we can measure remotely. Within... 16 months from the very first moment that Dave Albert created this little first system. That is also the new world we live in. So we have to really look into that. And it's not the end because some of you might have heard about the Google contact lens. So this is the lens that we're working on together with Google and Novartis that is measuring glucose level in tear fluid of people with diabetes. 
sending that into your smartphone and off, not being uh, needing to prick you every now and then and stuff gets smaller and smaller. We, we're going to be chipped just like our pets uh, with these RFID chips. So you have to create for these kind of incitables also a position for that. And the, the interesting thing that I think is that for the first time ever, we will be able, due to continuously monitoring, to be present at the moment and time that somebody gets sick. Just imagine what that means in terms of epidemiological aspects and, and barriers that we could uh, harness from that. So wrapping it up a bit, just wanted to <laughs> confront you with this uh, little uh, nice research that is being done at, uh, at uh, Washington University uh, at this very moment, being able to wash down a human's heart refill it, just like, let's call it like that, with stem cells from the actual patient themselves that will get this donor heart back completely flooded with their own stem cells. So we're looking at a society where we really will step into something like a quick fit of healthcare, uh, getting people in and getting them out within the hour, for instance. I really do hope not, but it's hopefully it creates this little tension and sense of urgency that we don't, are, that we are not able to sit back and relax with it, and really have to engage on that. And with that, I've just written now these uh, these little takeaways: look and listen to what patients really need, because that is the first step that you have to take, and not the last step. The continuum of health not only needs to incorporate the nurses, but also from front to end, from cradle to cradle, so to speak, and not just look at this one specific phase that we as hospital or you as GP or the physiotherapist runs into. And data really is completely useless if you don't add any meaning to that. And that's the problem where a lot of the healthcare, the PHRs and other systems run into it. You have to be able to action on that. The system we now created is able to, from these thresholds, send questionnaires to patients, call them actually, give them text, SMS, and those kind of systems. And the other thing that we really need is a global approach. Healthcare will be globalized. Uh, we need ruling for that. We need to share resources. No problem if somebody in India will run into our radiology uh, files, for instance. And the next thing we really should uh, work on, I think, is there should be some kind of worldwide reimbursement system for collaborations that will go across these continuum of healthcare payment systems. With that, I would love to round up and give back the, uh, the microphone and the floor to uh, our friends. Thank you for that.